Um, so this is going to be really interactive, and we want participation. So um, if you have a cell phone with connection, Wi-Fi connection, we want you to scan that QR code, and there's going to be interactive portions where you can uh, participate. And also, there's oh. a there's a uh, link to the slide or to the notes. So if you want to download the notes and help take notes as well, that would be great. Or put questions there or suggestions for next time. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Anybody get the pictures? So the objective of this workshop is to figure out ways that the ISB can help you with your career progression. So we're here just to get ideas and find out ways we can be more helpful. So the outline is, is we're going to talk about how we all got our jobs as curators, how you write a resume or a CV, and then what skill sets um, we can learn or help you learn to enhance your career growth. Okay, so yeah, Randy and I are first going to give you a little bit of background about ourselves. So we've been doing these workshops together for several years now at the ISB conferences. Um, we came up with this idea to talk to people about their career paths and see ways that the Biocreation Society can help uh, all of us with our career growth and progression or with us recruiting people to the field and training the next generation of biocreators. So a little bit about my background, um, I currently work for a nonprofit in uh, Arizona called the Critical Path Institute as the Associate Director of Data Science. I work on some specific projects, including the um, Rare, Disease, Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data and Analytics Platform. I'm also an ontology developer. I work on the Mondo Disease Ontology and an application ontology for CPATH. And at CPATH, there's also a curation team, which they call data managers. And they also have data engineers and data scientists. So work with other types of biocreators and biocreator related um, colleagues. And so my specific career path was I entered this field coming from um, bench science. I was a molecular biologist. And then I uh, got a job um, at Oregon Health and Science University as a scientific data curator. My academic title and my first position was a research associate. And then uh, I had an internal permission to become a lead curator for our group. And um, then I moved on recently to CPATH, where I'm now the associate director of data science. And I've also held titles, um, academic titles, which are a senior research associate, research assistant professor. I went on the faculty track and visiting associate research professor. So we'll talk a bit today about our perspectives and our careers, and also um, we'd love to hear from all of you about your, your careers and how you've progressed through them, or any advice that you have that we can give each other. Um, maybe as an outcome of this workshop, we could write up a paper that describes some advice, general advice about careers in, in this field that we can help each other and help other people entering the field. And I'm Randy, um, I have a very strange background in that I'm an MD. But I always did research, and I um, did a basic science postdoc in T-cell signaling. And then just sort of fell into this accidentally and found out that I really like data much better than patients. Um, <laughs> and I've been, it's much better, believe me. <laughs> and then I've been at the Immune Epitope database since its very beginning. It's a, a public um, resource that NIH funded, and it's housed at a nonprofit research institute in California with about 400 employees. Um, and our database is manually curated literature. We ex uh, curate all the, the experiments in a paper. And our curation team has eight full-time curators and two part-time curators, so we have kind of a big curation team. And I started there originally as a curator, and then I got really involved in the data structure and the website and um, controlling data standards and implementing ontologies into the database. So we want to talk about how you got a job as a curator, and that brings us to our first, uh, we don't have the survey yet. Should we go to the survey and come back? So um, in the link, you should be able to um, fill out this survey now, but these are the results of the survey that we took prior to the workshop. So people generally responded to a job ad. Um, originally, there weren't that many jobs from biocreation. It was more sort of you fell into it. Um, through networking or you were a bench scientist who worked at a project that they decided they needed to do some curation. Um, some of the projects have programmers or some bioinformatics uh, curators who are not um, biologists in the first place. And then there's people who transition within the company. They start at a different role and then they move over. So how much time should we give them for the survey? Oh, we should go back to that slide so they can get the code. Yeah, so if you 
uh, go to the QR code or go to slido.com and then enter that number. You should be able to respond to the uh, survey questions here. And if anybody can't access the Slido, we also have microphone runners, so if you just want to raise your hand and share your experiences with how you got your job as a bio-curator or bio-curation related field. We want this to be an interactive discussion. We don't want to just talk at you. We want all of us to talk to each other. We've got one response. Oh, not anymore. It feels sort of like a race. <laughs> <laughs> we know the internet is not great in here, so if you're having problems, feel free to raise your hands and uh, share. I think so. so your very first job about creation, did you respond to a job ad? Yeah, I did. I, just I didn't ran even into know someone it was. at the water cooler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Randy never worked over the water cooler back when we would go to work in person. <laughs> but that time it was kind of like the word people didn't know what the word meant. Yeah. And now job ads. That's great. So yeah, interesting. It looks like the majority of people responded to an ad. But uh yeah, the career of uh, biocreation, too, in some of these related uh, areas, it's interesting because there's not like a traditional path where you go to school and get a degree in biocreation or, or something like that. So it seems like the path to entry into this field is kind of varied depending on our, all of our different experiences. Would you move on? Sure. Okay. All right. So Chuck. I think the, the, that job ads is the highest number good. I mean, the thing is that... If you want the job, you can find the job through an ad. Uh, we also did a salary, a salary survey prior to the workshop, and then I also compared it to past year's salary surveys. And um, as you can see, most people make between 50 and 100,000, and this is in American dollars. But the sad thing was, is it was exactly the same four years ago. It hasn't changed. And with inflation as high as it is, that means we're all making less money than we used to. So um, talking about what sorts of ways you can increase your value at your current job or how, what ways you can uh, get your CV and get more job skills to move to a better paying job, maybe that's a timely thing or to show that you have more value at your current position. Okay, now we're gonna talk about how to make your CV. Right, so yeah, um, we wanna talk about some advice that we've collected from talking to people in the field about how to write your resume or your CV. So typically a resume will be like a one or two page kind of summary of the highlights of your career um, and work that you've done. The CV is something that's typically more used in academia where you have a long document that basically documents every single product of your scholarly work. So CVs can vary in length and tend to be quite lengthy. For, for example, my CV is about 40 pages long and it has all my presentations and, and publications and all the work that I've done. Um, which I needed to do when I was working in academia. It's no longer a requirement for me now that I've switched to um, working in a nonprofit. But so I uh, met with a lot of people, and Randy and I both did, met with a lot of folks in preparation for this workshop to get advice about um, writing your resume or your CV. And I'd love to hear any advice that you all have in addition to what we've collected here on the slides. Um, I was kind of interested in seeing if there was a lot of differences between different types of uh, industries or different fields. Uh, working in, in academia, for example, which is where I spent most of my career, it seems like the requirements for academia are very specific to progress through your, um, progress through your the ranks in academia. Uh, I talked to folks that work in industry to see the kind of the differences and how to get into industry. I'd love to hear from people here today, too, if I have any advice about how to uh, break into industry. Sometimes um, it can seem a little daunting for, for those of us who've never worked in industry before. I also talked to folks that work specifically in government organizations. Um, I talked to Nomi Harris and TBK, TBK Reddy from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, then um, I talked to Rama and Jane from uh, industry, um, from Genentech and Cybite. And um, I talked to our HRR person from CPATH, which is a nonprofit, and um, the, data, the, man, the lead data manager at CPATH, as well as the other data, data management team, see if there's any really any differences that came out from working in, in a nonprofit versus other types of institutions. And then Mary Ann Tooley, who's also on the ISB executive committee, she gave me advice about um, trying to pursue an opportunity, pursue opportunities in publishing. She works for Giga Science. So, um, 
So here's some of the um, collective information that I uh, gathered from talking with these uh, specific folks about key features of your resume or CV. So some key differences. One was in academia, you're required to have a CD, which, CV, which is quite lengthy, no page limit. It includes all of your publications and all of the scholarly products that are outcomes of your work. In industry, from what I've um, been told, you want to have a, resume, a, res a proper resume, two pages max, one to two pages. Um, you can select a few publications to highlight, but you do not want to include every single bit of information that you've done. A lot of times you can send, include a link to like your Google Scholar or like an ORCID, um, which can highlight the public, like, that can show an extensive list of all publications if that's something that you're participating in. In the nonprofit sector, um, I, when I applied for my position, I sent over my CV because that's what I had. But I think the usual, um, usual process is just sending over a short two-page resume. Um, and they, when, I, when I asked folks about it, they said listing the publication seemed fine if it was applicable. Um, Marianne said in publishing, she recommended also a resume, including publications. And Nomi, when I spoke to Nomi about um, specific applications into the government sector, with LBNL, she said it really depended on what kind of position you were applying to, that for research positions, maybe a CV would be more um, appropriate for more developer positions, it might be more appropriate to send a, a resume. And she suggesting, suggested uh, including publications or highlighting them depending on the length of the, um, the document. And um, so some rec other recommendations of things to include for putting, putting together your resume or CV, um, and for academia, academia, we have suggestions on uh, the next slide. But um, for industry, um, someone it was noted that uh, to mention FAIR, if you work on any kind of open source projects or uh, produce data that's FAIR, that's a good thing to include because that's kind of a um, popular uh, thing to work on these days, uh, commonly used phrase. Uh, also links to your LinkedIn profile. Um, and the nonprofit, uh, some things that were pointed out from people I spoke to were mentioning like specific analytical skills that you have, if you have any previous data experience, um, speaking to the competencies for a specific position. Um, if, you have, if you are active on GitHub, including a link to your GitHub website, um, any links to websites that have any kind of analyses or visualizations or can display any kind of work that you have done. Um, Marianne said within publishing, um, experience and knowledge about the domain that you're applying to. So if Giga Science focuses on a particular domain, so demonstrate that you have experience in that domain or whatever kind of journal or publisher you're applying to. Demonstratable communication skills, um, ability to demonstrate that you're meticulous and detail-oriented and can work in under time-sensitive um, manner, and uh, ability to keep up with new developments in the field. And then um, and the, when I spoke to people working in the government, they recommended including summaries of work that you've done, um, GitHub links, and links to publications. So um, based on my experience from putting together my CV for um, when I worked in academia, these are some things that I recommend to include in putting together your, your CV or your resume and just highlighting the work that you do. And then also have some examples here of ways that ISB can potentially help you with um, kind of showcasing your work and, and getting credit for the work that you do. So um, for biocreator specifically, it's kind of, especially in an academic setting, if you work for a university, the field of biocreation is kind of a non-traditional track that doesn't follow the usual kind of scientific tracks that are, are um, reviewed for promotion and tenure usually. So um, when I was working in academia under Melissa Ann Hendel, we did a lot of work to try to um, ensure that we got proper attribution for the work that we were doing. And we um, made efforts to make sure we highlighted specific scholarly products that were non-traditional products of our, of our work. So some things that I have included in my CV personally that might be relevant to some of you here are things like membership in professional societies. So if you're members here at the, at the ISB, that's something that can be included. Um, additionally, uh, major committee and service responsibilities. And if you are looking for some service to, um, to do, the ISB has a lot of community volunteer opportunities. So if you haven't spoken to any of us from the executive committee and would like to volunteer, please let us know or if you'd like to inquire. Is there a question? Before I forget, <laughs> I just wanted to make the point about 
uh, academic CVs that it, m there may be geographical differences. I don't know if you looked into that. No, not at all. Can but you speak to that? <laughs> only because for the UK, we wouldn't expect an open... Well, for a bio-curated job post, we would not expect an, a CV of more than, say, three pages. Oh, OK. Like, even for tenure, I think you're limited to something like a four-page, three to four-page application. I don't know if anybody else in... UK Academia has got any more information on that, but I got s applications for our last post that were like 40 pages long, including printouts of all slides. So <laughs> when people don't take it literally, don't put your entire presentations in and tr try and keep the length reasonable, because th these are printed out and given to, if you've got 40 CVs, you, you cannot read a 40 page CV, 40 CVs, so don't provide a 40 page CV. <laughs> So Val, when you have the biocarriers applying, are they applying, are they research, uh, research associate level or are they faculty level? Sorry? Are they, are they research level or are they faculty or is that different in the UK? It's different. Yeah. So like I'm not even, I'm not faculty and the, I don't know any bio curators that have got from above the senior postdoc level in the UK really. There's maybe a handful, it's really hard so. There's no, there's no way that you would get tenure as a bio curator in the UK easily. Yeah. And people have tried, but even at any level, as they would, for tenure they may expect a CV that long. The only time I've done one, even remotely in that length, is in grant applications, and usually that the CV would still be, maybe three pages, and the publications can take up the rest of the length, but we wouldn't provide that length of CV, but it'd be good to hear if anybody else has got any experience. Um, like I know there are fly base ones, you may. Yeah, from my perspective, I was actually a faculty at the University of Colorado and at Oregon Health and Science, so maybe my perspective is a little different. Um, I was going to say, from an industry perspective, you have to bear in mind that the CVs don't go directly to you either. They go via a recruiter most of the time. Mm. And, so, uh, you know, and the recruiters don't have experience of the domain. And so they're just looking for like keywords really, mm -hmm. or they'll go to LinkedIn and look for keywords on your CV. So, you know, that's like, that's the sort of level. You should be just be like highlighting those things that you think are gonna be good for the job you're applying for, so. Yeah, great, thank you. Any other questions? Nico? There. Yeah, thank you for um, many of the recommendations. If you're a software developer or you go to, to industry positions, they kind of recommend now to quantify some of the pieces of your work when you're, you know, saying, okay, I was in this position. I managed, let's say, a team of so many, so many people, or I successfully managed to drop the computation the, in, uh, or the computation time of this and that project. Is there any recommendation in terms of for bio curators, like what kind of quantifiable information you should put on your CV, like how many, I don't know, curation records you edited, or how many terms you contributed to ontologies, or something like that? I think I saw an Epicuron. Federica is working mm. on. That's a possibility. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Do you know about that? Does anyone know about that? It was a talk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that seems like a really useful thing to say. I've, you know, contributed, on my CV I have, I've contributed to like 20 different ontologies or something like that. I've never quantified the number of terms I've added, but something that we could do. Do you have a question? Um, yeah, I was just gonna make a comment really. Um, in terms of, so I've, I've worked in academia, I've worked in publishing, I've worked in some more general industry, pharma at the moment. Nice. Um, content, uh, so uh, cover letter is really important. So mm -hmm. I think I echo what's been said previously at CV of two, three absolute max, and do not try and put everything in your CV. Um, not only do the CVs not go to the hiring manager initially, often they go through kind of an automated process anyway. So it's not even a person looking at your CV in many cases. So you just need to make your, sure your keywords ping out. So look very carefully at the job description. Make sure you've used those phrases in the right places in your CV, in your cover letter. Really important. Um, in terms of how you describe your experiences, I, I hope people are aware of the STAR method. So that is, I'm going to just read it out. Uh, 
So, um, oh God. Right, so situation, task, action, result. And, you know, it shouldn't be more than like two or three sentences. So I've been a uh, sort of a hiring manager as well. And you don't have time, as Val said, you do not have time to read through the detail of everything. Um, something that pings out at me is if I see spelling errors or grammatical errors, <laughs> I'm afraid that CV goes to the bottom of the pile, especially yeah. if it's a curator job, because it's attention to detail. <laughs> so really, <laughs> job, really yeah. <laughs> think about that. That's so important. Yeah. That's more important than listing all of your um, publications. When you get to industry, people just need a general awareness. Oh, yeah, this, this person was an academic and they did some publications. It matters less what you did. It matters more what you describe you know, in your CV, in your cover letter, is what was relevant. So go through your CV, pick out the relevant things to what the job you're, you're applying to, and then use that STAR method to say, this was the situation, this is what I had to do. This is how I did it, and this was the result. The result being really important. You know, we improved efficiency by 40%. Key things, that's mm -hmm. super important. Quantifiable, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and just to comment, you know, how many, the numbers of how, you know, how many proteins you annotated or something. I have that on my CV of how many Go annotations I've had, and I've been to a few job interviews where that's been super impressive. So, mm. yeah, put the number in if you've got it, absolutely. Nice. Uh, Paula? Oh. Uh, yeah, please. Hi, good morning. I just wanted to know how easy or how difficult it is to find a good bio curator. <laughs> and the just curator, just who doesn't just like tag the entries, but who really bring the field knowledge to the forefront, how difficult or how easy it is? That's a great question. <laughs> it's really hard to say. And I actually should mention, too, that my, I just recently switched jobs to the Critical Path Institute in my previous position at the University of Colorado as a bio-creator on the faculty track is open. So, and I can say that the position's been open now for a few weeks at least, or maybe in a month, and last time I asked, they hadn't had any applications. So it seems right now maybe it's a little bit difficult, but I think it really just depends on the opportunity. Yeah, and I think it also depends on the subject matter of the database. So we, we've we hired three, probably three or four people in the last three or four years, and we need them to be subject matter expertise first and then want to curate is actually a problem we've had. We've had a lot of people apply and then when we explain what the job is, they say, oh my gosh, that sounds horrible. And like you, end the, you end the interview right there. <laughs> so, <laughs> you have to, you have, so I think that that's the biggest thing is explaining what bio creation is. And, if, and this is like usually a personality test of like, oh, that sounds really cool or no, that's not for me. And people tend to be afraid to leave the bench like that's been a big problem when you need a, a bench scientist to transition. They're kind of afraid they can never go back, so they have to be sure they want a computer job. In my experience, though, I worked on the bench, and at the, my cohort that I went through graduate school with, like, at least half of us hated it and left the bench, and we're looking for alterna <laughs> alternative careers. <Maybe>. Yeah. <laughs> so, Paula. Yeah, I wanted to add something to what Jane and Vasha said, which is a fundamental. I mean, what they said is is is, is fundamental. So one thing is to building on to that um, the LinkedIn bit. So yes, it is true that um, CVs and resumes go through automated uh, processing first. So uh, keywords are important, and one way that you can sort of double check if you've done a good work in your LinkedIn profile is how many um, unwanted contacts you get from recruiters, from headhunters. Ah, that's smart. <laughs> because that's usually something that, oh, that's all spam, don't look at it, but I'm not saying you need to reply to each and every one of those, but if you start getting those sort of uh, contacts on LinkedIn, it is an indication that your CV has been picked up because of keywords. Interesting, that's great advice. And the other thing is in terms of uh, metrics, um, how to, you know, how do we sort of quantify, to, to reply to Nico, how do we quantify what we're doing? So for example, if you've been work, if you have been working um, in, um, as an ontology developer, one thing you could say beyond the strict number of terms that you've created, Varsha was mentioning the annotations, but if you've been working on um, editing, developing an ontology, you could also mention the resources that use that ontology. Oh, great point. 
and um, and then in the case of the larger ontologies like Go, um, you know, you could mention how um, important it is. And there's, there are studies in Go. The last advice I would give, and this is a general advice for CVs and resumes, is have someone else read what you've written. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, <laughs> that had been fundamental f for me as a non-native speaker um, early on, but I still think that um, it's a good piece of advice because, uh, you know, some, sometimes we just lose sight of... Yeah. So look to the person to your left and then send them your resume to have them proofread. <laughs> I agree with the point so far. One of the key thing is consistency between what people put in their CV and on LinkedIn. Because mm -hmm. if they're very different, it's not necessarily a problem, but you probably need to have somebody explaining why. And if you want to do a career change, it's probably good to sort of be open about that in your profile and then just mention the skills that you bring to that new role. Mm -hmm. That's great, good point. Thanks. So I, this, this, is, this is more of a question actually to everybody, but I, I, so I absolutely agree that, that you know, the, the bio curation contribution, the output is a really important thing to, to, to mark up. Um, and I confess I missed the Apicuron presentation, so I don't, I, but I have a feeling that Apicuron is more about publications and ontologies and so on, but the, to the ORCID claiming um, for data sets, um, I wonder whether, as providers of, of, of data resources as well as by curators, are we do we are there enough services to allow people to do this? Is it possible to claim all data sets to Orchid? I think probably not for some of the big some, for some of the big data resources. So, do we so yeah. as as by curators do we need to be building services onto our resources to allow people to track their outputs more? Yeah, and that sounds like, like Apicurion is doing right. Yeah, I don't think you can attach. As far as I know, I've never attached a data set to. Working. I'll try and summarize Apicuron very quickly. So if you're building a resource and you keep track of the provenance of the people who make contributions in terms of ORCID IDs, you can then upload that provenance information onto Apicuron, and this is a centralized place for looking. But Guy's question was, if you've created a data set and deposited it somewhere, uh, and, and then you get provenance, you know, how do we make people link those to their ORCID directly? So Apicuron is kind of a one direction thing, but there's some resources that allow you to put your information on ORCID. And, and then I think Reactome is a good example. Uh, in the last couple of years, they've put a lot of effort into making sure that you can uh, attach your ORCID ID in Reactome, and I think that they let you push back. I know Wikidata has also made it, or so not Wikidata, sorry, uh, Wikipathways, you can also push your curations back onto your ORCID profile. Oh, Obo also does orchids. So, so, I, so I, think there are, I think there are at least two routes. One is that the data resource itself captures orchids and tracks them, um, and then feeds that into the orchid system somehow. The other route is that people go post hoc, and they go and say, these are the data sets that I've contributed. And that's a model that, that I, I don't know about React Home, but that's a model that ENA takes, and, 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 and certainly other EBI data resources. Um, and then collectively, you end up with a, 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 a record of who's done what. But that it was really, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I suppose data resources can choose either of those two or both those two models, um, but I wonder, it'll be interesting to know what the overall coverage is, because if I'm, if I'm a bio curator and I'm, all of my output is onto a data resource where there is no option to do this ORCID linking, then I, I don't look good alongside a CV where, 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 where I, the next curator has contributed to a data resource that does provide these things. So I think in some cases, for those of us who have deposited data, maybe in the pre-ORCID times, um, there needs to be, we, we could do a bit of a creative work. So for example, um, when I used to work on micro data analysis, I think I deposited a, a dozen um, 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 entries for micro experiments with metadata onto GEO and um, I could go back and look into whether it's possible for me to add an ORCID, whether they have a system, and if not, I could just provide a link uh, because Geo is searchable by um, last name or uh, entry, so I could pull, pull out a link with all of the entries and just put a link as a, a bit.ly on my resume, stuff like that. 
Or we could push with the uh, stakeholder to um, link to ORCID. So we need to be stakeholders in that as well, I think. To, to, to make sure this can be condensed, for those people that work across multiple, you know, multiple uh, data resources, it would be great to have a single place click here and you get the full, uh, full record of output. But yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, hi, this is Andy Hope from Rancho Biosciences. Um, just a couple of comments on the CVs. I completely concur that it's two pages with appropriate information describing what you do. Uh, one of the things I would say from the perspective of Rancho's position is I would like to see more uh, if, if uh, curators have had experience with various scripting languages and things like that. It's becoming more of a requirement for the things that we do. But to address the question earlier, if assuming a candidate has submitted a resume to us, there's probably a, a pre-screening interview type of thing, but any candidate for any position at Rancho, we, we have the candidate take a test. Mm. So whatever this says on their resume, if they've got through that step in the process, the next step is then to take a test. Then we assess based on the, how they perform in that test, whether they then progress or not in the interview process. Nice. And that kind of answers or gets after the question of how do you know if someone's going to be a good bio creator or not. Um, this is all really great. Um, I'm going to keep going. I, I think you've had, probably had a chance to read some of the content on these slides, or I shared the slides, so hopefully you can look at this um, later. Um, a lot of this stuff is already discussed, so just a, I'll just uh, highlight a few things that maybe we didn't touch upon. Um, I thought one really important uh, point that was made, um, I think it was Jane that told me this, is that the qualifications are more of a wish list. So if you're looking at a job ad, um, don't feel intimidated if you don't meet every single one of the qualifications. Uh, people should feel empowered to, to apply for positions even if they don't meet every single qualification that's listed on there. And um, someone suggested that just try to demonstrate an aptitude to learn. Um, mention and write, write, always write a cover letter whether it's required or not, and in the cover letter mention that maybe I have deficiencies in this area, but I'm very interested in learning, and I've already found some like online materials to try to learn this or that. Um, just some advice about um, just uh, some advice about when selecting jobs to to consider other opportunities that maybe sometimes you never know what you're going to be. A good fit. When I entered this field, I didn't really even know what biocreation or ontologies were, and it turned out to be a perfect fit for me. Um, and with all this discussion about keeping the resume short and uh, to two or three pages, um, one suggestion that I have is creating a personal website where you can add all of your information about all the work that you've done. If you want to highlight or showcase more of the work that that you've done that you cannot fit on your on your resume or your CV, and someone also suggested to me. So if you're looking for a job to post your CV on social media, like on Twitter or Mastodon. And then I talked to the HR person at CPATH, and she gave me a lot of interesting advice about how the HR process actually works. And that um, she mentioned that the human resources systems will pre-screen the resumes, like was mentioned, and that they will look for keywords and then knock out uh, resumes that don't meet the criteria for the keywords. And then she also mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, is that sometimes they knock the resumes out by mistake. So you can apply via different mechanisms like LinkedIn and Indeed.com are two big um, areas where, people, where, where companies do recruiting. So if you get kicked out, if your resume doesn't get picked up by, um, in a, by a potential employer when you submit through uh, LinkedIn, for example, try submitting again through Indeed.com if you really want to try to get a specific position. And then, of course, I think networking maybe is one of the best ways, too, to to get the position that you want or get your foot in the door. And then um, this is an example of a personal website that I created for myself. And there's a link to this GitHub, GitHub repository. So this was created by one of my former colleagues at OHSU. He made, a, he made this template for creating a personal website. I forked this repo and made this website for myself. And the link is here. So if anyone wants to make their own personal website, um, you can fork. Um, it's from uh, my colleague, Ted. You can fork this repository and create a website. And this is a really nice way to showcase all the work that you've done, if, especially if you're trying to keep your resume succinct and uh, limited um, content. You can put everything up on, on, the, on your site. OK. Um, so we've already been discussing a lot of, uh, 
advice to job seekers, but does anyone have, uh, if you want to do this poll, uh, we can talk about additional advice for job seekers. And have it documented. And I hope people are help, help, helping take notes, because this is really great content that we're discussing, and we'd love to be able to share this with the rest of the community. Hi. Hi, yeah. Uh, I just want to ask what people's impression of some of this more peripheral stuff. So, for example, I guess being on, I guess being on ResearchGate is more of a liability than an asset, okay? And there's also publons, if you've been doing some refereeing. And we're pinged about every month with some kind of, um, some kind of profiling service as to whether you're in the top 1% of this or that. So I don't know whether, which ones of these have any real value or do you, do you include your, uh, for the uh, ones that have been around a while, do we include our age factor or not mention it? Yeah. I love that question. There are a lot of kind of researcher profiling systems and yeah, I'm sure we all get these emails like, oh, do you want to add your publication to ResearchGate or whatever? Um, does anyone have any experience working with any of these and say yes or no to any of them? I personally would probably just look at ORCID or PubMed or Google Scholar. I don't find a lot of value from ResearchGate or a lot of the other things. Some great advice coming in here on Slido. Um, for me, I found LinkedIn is probably a good one. Twitter was good until recently. <laughs> yeah. And sadly, yeah. Twitter was really great actually for making contacts, but I think people tend to be moving over to LinkedIn now. Any other advice that anyone wants to discuss for job seekers? Uh, looks like we have some networking, uh, hiring, contacting hiring managers directly, give examples of being proactive. Uh, this, as, as another peripheral thing, alt metrics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a bit odd now because because the, uh, as, as, as Twitter winds down, I think half their impact on alt metrics has disappeared, but they still seem to be hanging on in. Um, so I, I actually quote my three highest alt metrics for what it's worth. Uh, is, is this a thing people think is a good idea? I personally like alt metrics. I think it's a nice way to get credit for work that's not traditionally tracked. Anyone else have any opinions? What do you think, Randy? Do you use all metrics? No. Nope. Uh, so not about all metrics, but it's sort of a, a general comment about um, kind of industry jobs. So we work a lot with um, kind of large, you know, pharma and, you know, companies with a lot of life sciences type data. Um, and I think at the moment, I've had this conversation with a few people, is, um, you know, there's a, there's a real um, paucity, paucity, what's the word, um, of, of, the, of the types of skills, this kind of like understanding of the fair infrastructure, knowledge about ontologies and, you know, best practice for bio-curation and that kind of thing. There's a real requirement for that in industry. Um, but I guess they don't, they don't really have this, I don't know, this, that, that community seems a bit disjoint with this community. And I don't know how, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, and then maybe that's a part, part of that is how those jobs are advertised. Um, so I would just say, think, you know, I, and I think the, the type of, you know, I guess it's broadly by curation in the kind of farmers and, and stuff is, you know, those those roles are a bit broader than what we think of as by curation in this community. It's not necessarily a database and you go through and you curate ent you know, entries. It's more around kind of like organizing knowledge and being proactive and, you know, being able to sort of sell the kind of the, the fair, the benefits of fair data and within the organization. So think about those sorts of things um, mm -hmm. if you're applying, so. Great, thanks. All right, looks like answers are still coming in. Um, I think we'll move on. Uh, we, I think we can all go back and look at the Slido results too. Uh, thanks everyone for sharing all this uh, information and we can, we'll uh, aggregate all this afterwards and, and disseminate it um, as the, after, the, after the workshop. Um, so next, Randy, we're going to uh, we're going to talk, um, brainstorm, do a bit of brainstorming about skill sets that someone can learn to enhance their career growth. So uh, this 
Is this one great? I can't tell if it's recording. Um, so we, we uh, talked to people before the workshop and tried to find out what sort of relevant skills in general people thought they were using in their daily jobs or that they were looking for in candidates and broke them down into these four categories of basic skills, technical, interpersonal, and, and project management tools. So the basic school uh, skills, I think we've already kind of hit on most of these that you need to have good domain knowledge and then oral, written, and reading, um, communication and comprehension, attention to detail, everyone in biocreation says that over and over again, and then the ability to uh, critically think and interpret the data, and then knowledge of resources that may be important to the project. So that's something that sometimes um, new resources come out all the time, and if you're really focused in your current job, you may not be totally aware of the new resources. So taking some time to just learn what's out there, you know, in networking opportunities and read the posters and t go to talks because there may be new things that you can bring to your current job or help become expert in to get your new job. And then I think technical was mentioned, the programming, some projects um, definitely you need to be uh, able to program to do the biocution, but sometimes you don't, but it's very valuable if you're able to sort of understand and communicate with the programmers. That's something that's really valuable in most biocuration jobs, even if you don't know yourself. And then um, many of the programming skills you can learn on your own. So if you're not using Python in your current job, there's plenty of online uh, tutorials and courses, and many of them free that you can use. And I think a lot of the programmers in our field are self-taught. And then um, interpersonal skills, I think we all know about that, because a lot of times the bio-curation, the bio-curator is in a layer between several different types of teams and projects. So you need to be able to collaborate well and work in a team environment. And many times you also need to manage yourself to prioritize your own projects and organize your own yourself. A lot, some, there's a lot of projects where you're independent and time management, I guess, also comes in there. There's also a lot of remote bio curators, so you need to be able to get the job done on your own time. And then project management tools. Some of the jobs uh, you are managing teams or uh, at least using these skills to interact with each other. So like GitHub, obviously, and um, all the communication uh, tools like Slack and Teams and Skype and Discord and Google Docs, obviously, and Microsoft Teams, all of those things. And if you don't use them for your current project, there's still things you can use on your, in your own time. You can learn on your own to use Discord and Skype if they're not what you're your uh, project needs and those aren't things you don't necessarily think of to put on their resume or in their cover letter. So then uh, we actually looked at actual job openings. So at the time, this was March of this year, and searching open jobs um, from the United States. So my browser is sort of biased and was trying to only show me jobs in America, but I tried to get it to cooperate. So um, I looked at the current jobs. I only found 16 at the time that had some sort of biocuration keyword in the uh, description of the job. And so six of them asked for you to have a PhD or MD, four of them said a master's or a PhD, and three of them just said any degree in this field, they didn't specify, and then the other jobs didn't mention whether or not you needed a degree, and I think that you sort of mentioned uh, the wish list, that it's, uh, many of the jobs, they're not quite sure, They'll, they're just putting it out there to see who wants to be a bio-curator. So I don't think you should let the exact parameters of the job and limit you, go ahead and apply, because you don't know how many applicants they're gonna get. You know, if they ask for a PhD and they only get masters applying, they may take you or they may want to train you on site. Um, six of them wanted you to be a subject matter expertise in one of these uh, bulleted areas, and computational biology is not something you can learn in your free time, but you can learn about data standards, you can learn about FAIR, you can attend FAIR, workshops and uh, talks online, and you can learn uh, ontology in your own time. You can't learn high throughput genomics in your free time. But, but there's a lot of areas to enhance your skill set without having to go back to college. And then programming, seven of the jobs asked for you to be a Python programmer. That's becoming increasingly um, part of the job. I don't think it was originally as, as common. And many people are Python self-taught. Like I said, there's a lot of um, resources to help you learn it on your own. 10 of them asked for just miscellaneous computer skills. Um, many of them also you can get on your own time. And then all the soft skills. Um, they always mention communication skills and being independent, detail-oriented. And then just, uh, just for in general information of those 16 jobs, eight are in North America, seven in Europe, and one in Asia. And it, there probably is some bias 
in the job uh, sites I was searching. I'm not being aware, maybe there's other, like you mentioned, Indeed, and LinkedIn, there, there may be other, maybe uh, Bioker, the ISB could find out what these other, <laughs> if there are, if you are, anyone here is aware of other ones we're not aware of, uh, let us know. And then uh, five of the jobs said they were on site fully, five said fully remote, that you could live anywhere. Four of them were, were hybrid, saying you needed to be able to come in once or twice a week, and then the rest didn't even mention it, so I don't actually know. And then nine were academic, six industry, and one uh, government. It's just sort of an overview of what was available at the time. And then the ISB posts jobs on the website. Uh, always go there, and if you have a job, if you even come across a job that's not yours, um, send it in and get it posted, because we want to help the community find those jobs, and it's not always necessarily easily because the keywords and the job titles are really variable. And then from those two previous slides, we built this wheel of ex relevant skills with the goal of people thinking about where their current skills lie. So like if one of the pies you're very uh, weak in, it would be good for the ISB to find out because they could um, organize or um, promote courses and online tutorials in those areas that people find that they're, they're weak and lacking. Or it may be at the next bio-curation conference or in the future have workshops specifically on those skills if enough people are interested in increasing that, that area of their expertise. That's where we're at at the, tell us what we can do and tell us what you're most interested in learning and what sorts of things you think the ISB could do better at promoting jobs and helping people change careers. I think we have a slide out. Yeah. Oh, so these are some of the survey results that uh, we put out a pre-survey and some things that people um, requested preemptively. So uh, this has been a, Thing, funding has been an area that's been actively discussed amongst the ISB since I've been involved and in how, how can the ISB help make funding agencies more aware of the relevance of the work that we do. That's something that I think everybody would um, really appreciate uh, helping with funding. Always an issue in, amongst projects and grant funded projects like what we do. Um, other suggestions were helping with employment. Um, having a way for us, for the ISB to list how core skills can be transferable, um, providing synonyms for those skills so they can be, um, to know what you want to, how, what keywords you should be using for job ad advertisements or on your own personal CVs, um, ideas for career progression. I think it really varies in a lot of different institutions on how bio creators progress through their career. Um, if there's a path for promotion or if there's kind of, if it's a kind of a terminal position. Um, suggestions to um, access a pool of candidates. This is something that we don't currently have in the ISB, which I think is a really great suggestion if, if we could somehow maybe share information if we're looking for work um, within the ISB community, do that better. Um, for people that are looking and that for looking to be hired and people for look, hiring managers looking for employees, offering any kind of traineeships. Um, we do have a, in the ISB, we do have a subcommittee that's focused on training and outreach, and there's a goal that um, Federica was interested in trying to develop some training materials and making them available to the um, to bio creators, which um, has been on pause because of her uh, maternity leave, but that's something that's on our, on our radar to do, and um, if anyone's interested in helping develop training materials and sharing materials um, via the ISB, that's something that I think that would be really beneficial to our community. Um, offering career services. Um, I think all of us here have the opportunity to be mentors to other people or um, have be mentored by other people. So maybe that's something we could potentially do is come up with some kind of mentoring program within the community where we could um, help each other. Um, networking opportunities like this are always a great opportunity for us to get to know each other and find out what other people are working on. Um, and also, yeah, we mentioned training. Um, yeah, tutorials, and um, and then I think it's a great idea to have uh, tutorials um, at, and workshops here at these conferences or offer tutorials that are online and can be attended virtually throughout the year. And then, I think we have a Slido. Yeah, so could you all please let us know um, what's your highest priorities for the ISB? What, what would you like to see this community do for, for you and for each other? 
And if you want to um, speak verbally, uh, please raise your hand. And these are just some of the options. These are things that came in. Initial suggestions. And does anyone have any um, advice as to how we could specifically help with finding jobs and career development? Uh, thanks. Um, I think it was mentioned before, but I mean, we talked about the ORCID thing, but that maybe that's a really practical thing that the ISB could do is all of the databases that are part of the ISB, just, just record what your curators are doing for them. Just, you know, find a way to make it easy for them to say they've worked on X number of genes or they've provided this number of annotations. Combined with that, ISB then approach ORCID. I think it was a comment someone had left approach ORCID and say, we've got this whole bunch of curators, we want to make sure this data is represented on ORCID profiles generally. It will also potentially encourage other scientists who don't consider themselves as curators to also have their contributions recorded, and that can only be a good thing. So maybe that's a practical step yeah. for the ISB. That's a great suggestion. I've met someone from ORCID before at uh, Force 11 conference, so um, that'd be really great. Um, yeah, I was just thinking maybe um, a networking event where you could get some representatives from industry and some representatives from this community just to sort of present a little bit about, you know, what they do, what the skills are, and just to try and, you know, I don't know, yeah, get that community mix a little bit more. That might be quite useful. That's a great idea. Yeah, I feel like most of the my collaborators and folks I interact with are not from industry. So, I give a show of hands, how many people here are from industry? So, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we want to know you. <laughs> uh, we had some other hands up. Uh, yeah, Randy suggested we maybe could have an industry work workshop next year. A lot, a lot of this is personal experience. A lot of it, curators in academia are intimidated by industry. They feel like it's a foreign <laughs> space, and so it could be good to hear from the the curators in industry to tell them it's okay and it's a safe space for you to come join. <laughs> yeah, um, going back to the comment about uh, being able to credit and recognize the contributions of curators to various databases. That's, in principle, one of the reasons why we've been developing APCURON mm. in order to be able to uh, recognize all those activities. And, uh, in fact, at the moment it's being rolled out across a couple of databases. We're always happy to accept more databases. And, I mean, ideally, if we have a large enough number of databases contributing to this, this can be um, the place in the middle so that you don't overload the, the ORCID entries mm. with lots of minutia and, and, and in details and you still have um, a, a more complete view of the contributions of people especially for those who come from the from the community curation sites who so who don't who are not yet employed by any of the major databases and who would like to make a career in this um, being able to to be seen for what they've already contributed can be a useful way in order to uh, boost their profile and then eventually get hired by one of the um, databases as curators. Mm -hmm. So we would like very much to, um, to partner with ISB on this in order to promote this as an opportunity to have a sort of curator profile. Yes, and I think uh, we're interested in that too, so that's great. And also on your ORCID, you can have links to websites on like the left-hand side, so you could say, like, here's my Epicuron link, and then link out to that. But then someone has to know to look there and then look at that to, get, to properly recognize what was done. Yeah, just one thing, um, Epicurion is already able to push data into ORCID. Oh, cool. So awesome. we already have that part uh, covered so that we can aggregate the, the, the contributions and have, say, say, if someone curated 200 PFAM entries, it will not be 200 entries in ORCID, but rather it can be one mm. entry saying that this person curated 200 of those, and those can be updated uh, periodically. So it's kind of a way to, to summarize the information for ORCID, yet at the same time be able to, to show the detailed view for those uh, interested parties on, on the ORCID side itself or on the component databases. Excellent. Um, oh, I just wanted to add to the metrics that don't get too hooked up on that numbers 
are the most important thing because they're not always and I'd be more impressed to see sort of project based things where people have really thought about things and made sure coverage is good or done QC projects than just saying they generated so many thousand go annotations that eventually needed removing because they just <laughs> over annotated so yeah that's true I'm not Sure. Yeah, no. and like what Paolo mentioned about impact too, so if someone's actually using your 70,000 annotations, that's one thing. But yeah, if they're getting deleted later, that's not as impressive. Uh, sorry, Nick, we have to really finish the session because we have to come back again by 1.10 after the lunch. So if anyone wants to say anything, they can talk during the lunch time or after, afterwards. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the session. So.